morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to Central Study Hour, where we study God's Word together and sing praises to Him together. Psalms 100, verse 1 to 2 reads, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. So this morning, before we start our study, we are going to come before His presence with singing. Our first song is Not I, But Christ, hymn number 570, 570. This was a request by Elena Dublin from New York, USA. We will be singing all verses. It's not us, but Christ. If you have a favorite song that you want to request to sing with us, you can go to our website, www.saccentral.org. Go to Contact Us and CSH Hymn Request. Place your hymn request and we'll be glad to sing it in an upcoming Sabbath. Our next song is hymn number 582, Working O Christ With Thee. This was the song request by Josephine Wagu from Cameroon. We will be singing all verses.
much for joining us in singing this morning. Um, our study this morning will be led to us by Brother Jeffrey Maxwell. But before our study, please, please join us as we pray together. Our dear, wonderful Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the Sabbath. Thank you that we can gather together to study your word and sing praises together and worship together as a family. I pray, Lord, that you will send your Holy Spirit to be with us this morning to help us understand your word and open our hearts, Lord, to receive your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to Sacramento Central's Central Study Hour here in Afar. Um, our lesson for this morning is going to be lesson number five, and it's called Faith Against All Odds. And if you want a copy of this lesson, either through CD or DVD, you can call us at 916-457-6511 or email us at ch, sorry, csh at saccentral.org. I always do that, say chs instead of csh. Ch, csh at saccentral.org. So good morning, happy, holy, and blessed Sabbath. If you're a Spanish, uh, Feliz Sabado. If you're a Tagalog, Magandang Sabado. If you're a Samoan, Manuel Zapati. And I'm sorry, I don't know too much more, but that's about, that's the extent of my foreign language, language when it comes to Happy Sabbath. And uh, before we get started, I just wanted to, to pray a quick little prayer uh, once again. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for your mercy and blessings towards us. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the grace that you give to us, and thank you for this Sabbath. And so, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us, that you will guide us, and that you will put your understanding in our hearts, and that you will give life to your word this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In nature, there is a curious phenomenon that happens in the animal kingdom, in the insect kingdom, and it's something called the circle of death, the circle of death. I don't know if anybody has ever heard of that phenomenon, but what it basically is, is it, sometimes you might find in nature where ants, ants are following each other in a circle. And it's called the circle of death. Can anybody guess why? Because they keep following each other in a circle for so long that they get exhausted and eventually they might die. So that's why they call it the circle of death. That's why they call it the circle of death. In the early Christian church, the church was on a right path. It was as ants marching on a path that God had ordained, but eventually some ants got off course, some big ants got off course and started to make a circle of death in our church. And that, of course, we know as the falling away, as Bible points out. But there were ants that came out of that circle and, and said, hey, look, you guys are going in a big old circle that's going to uh, end up in, in, in death, uh, but there's a better way. And these people we call reformers. Now, in light of the great controversy, that's what our Sabbath school quarterly is about, uh, we know that the great controversy started where? As Revelation chapter 12 brings out, yes, I see somebody pointing their finger up. Uh, the great controversy started as a war in heaven. War in heaven. Revelation chapter 12 brings that out. So back in, uh, in heaven, it's hard to picture how there could be war in heaven, but there was. That's what the Bible tells us pretty plainly. And of course, who was the main antagonist of this war? Lucifer, that great dragon, that red dragon that uh, deceives the whole world. But Satan was not allowed to stay up in heaven. Satan was eventually kicked out. And Jesus said, I saw Lucifer, Satan, fall as lightning from heaven. And the point where he was totally cast out was when? It was at the cross, right? It was at this point that the worlds saw the true nature of Satan. It was at this point that the universe beheld the truth of the great controversy. So at this point, salvation was secured, and Satan was no longer allowed access to the heavenly bodies. And it said, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, 
For the, for, for the devil has come down to you having what? Great wrath, because he knows he has but a short time. Now, it's been 2,000 years since that point, but, you know, as I've found as I get older, uh, time kind of gets, uh, gets quicker as you get older. And it's so funny, I, when, when I was five years old, I told my mom, you know, I said, Mom, as you get older, st time goes faster. And so she just kind of laughed at me, you know, being five years old. But uh, it's, it's true. And you can imagine somebody who's been around for oh, well over 6,000 years as Satan. 2,000 years probably doesn't seem that long to him. And uh, we know that one day to the Lord is his what? 1,000 years. So basically, Satan's got two days left. Two days left to do whatever he's going to do. Now, Satan, of course, having two days left, was not going to be silent, was he? He wasn't just going to let this thing go without a fight. And Satan has some stuff in stake with this, because if we understand the sanctuary services, we know that Satan is represented by what in, in the Day of Atonement? By the scapegoat, Azazel, that's what it was called. And all of this, uh, the confessed sins, this is not for atonement's sake, but this is for just, or judgment, or justice, there we go, justice is a good word, for justice's sake, Satan has to pay for all the sins that he helped commit. But not only the ones that he helped commit, but the, the sins that we repent of all go upon him as well to, for just desserts, for, for justice. So the more that we are, the, the, when, we are conf, when we are redeemed, when we confess our sins and Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness, Satan's going to have more to pay for, is what it boils down to. So Satan ha does have stake in it, and he wants to cause us to, as much as possible, to fall, to stumble, to not be saved. He wants to drag as many of us down as possible. Satan doesn't love you or me. He doesn't even love his own people. Those that worship him, he doesn't love. Uh, so he wants to cause their downfall. How could you love somebody if you don't mind bringing them down with you? And so Satan has a lot at stake. Um, and originally, we know back in the early centuries, the early church faced what? When it was on the right path, what did it face? It faced heavy persecution, right? So at that time, in the early centuries, Satan especially used the Roman Empire to persecute God's people and put to death a lot of people, threw them in coliseums and all that, that type of stuff. But there was a problem, at least for Satan anyways. The more that he... He uh, persecuted the saints, the more what happened? The more the church grew, right? The more that the, the church flourished. And one person said that you can mow us down, and I'm just paraphrasing here, you can mow us down, you can take us down, you can do whatever you want to us, but guess what? Our blood is as what? Is as seed, yes, as seed. So Satan's like, man, the more that I persecute these folks, the more they grow. Have you ever had a... Um, some type of infestation for it, where it seemed like the more that you try to get rid of something, the more it seemed to come back. Well, I can imagine what kind of, uh, what kind of headache that was causing to Satan's uh, folks there in Rome and uh, Satan's minions. So Satan changed his plan, and this is where the ants started to turn and make a big circle of death. It's, and by the way, the one of the biggest circles of death they have found was like 1,200 feet in circumference. So you got these ants going around, and it took them, I think, two and a half hours to make one complete revelation in this circle of death. They thought they were on the right path, because you know ants follow each other, right? They follow pheromones from the, from the ants in front of them. And um, they just kept, they keep following each other. And so bringing it back to, to the, the context of the great controversy, some ants got off track at this point. Satan was able to allure and deceive some major folks in the church. And what he got them to do is basically substitute the traditions of man in place of the word of God, in place of the word of God. And this started, as we know, the Roman papal church, the Roman papal church, the papal authority. And, um, but, but God called out some ants from that circle of death and uh, made them lights to the rest of the ants. And of course, the ants that wanted to keep the status quo, the ants that wanted to keep the, the circle of death going on forever, the ants that were in power didn't like this. So what did they do to the reformers? They persecuted them, right? They, we wanted to protect the status quo. And sometimes we can find ourselves, even as Adventists, as people, trying to protect 
the status quo. Sometimes we start going around in circles too, don't we? We start going around in circles of things that God really hasn't told us to do, or things, extra things that, that, that we put on top of what God has said. And Satan sometimes utilizes these to bring us around in circles and have us going around in circles. But we don't want to do that. We want God to take us out of those circles. So the Reformation, that is what this chapter talks a lot about, the Reformation. This time period fits within the seven churches. And by the way, the seven churches, don't let anybody tell you that the seven churches do not symbolize churches in different eras since Christ. Because I know there are some, even teachers out there who, and I've experienced that myself, who, who tell you, yeah, don't worry about that interpretation that the, the seven churches are, are literal time periods of the church. And I think, and, and, and it seemed like their whole premise was, is because we're always pointing out how this church is which church? This Laodicea, right? In general speaking, generally speaking. And it seems that People don't like to hear that too much. And so in, in my opinion, my, my narrow opinion, it seems like that's the reason they don't want to, to consider the churches as different impacts. But I have a, a quote from the Acts of the Apostles that actually kind of spells it out pretty clearly. It's Acts of the Apostles, page 585 from Sister White. She says, the names of the seven churches are symbolic of the church in different periods of the Christian era. So there it is right there from the Spirit of Prophecy. The number seven indicates completeness and is symbolic of the fact that the messages extend to the end of time, while the symbols used reveal the condition of the church at different periods in the history of the world. So yes, the seven churches do in fact represent different periods of the Christian church uh, throughout Christendom's time. Now, some people will say, well, those characteristics apply at every time. You know, there's Laodicean folks, there's, which, you know, it's probably true, but overall, this is the general characteristics of our church. Unfortunately, we get uh, one of the worst, actually probably the worst uh, description as far as Laodicea is concerned. And it's unfortunate, but it's, it's the reality. It's the reality. And so the church of this time was the church of Thyatira, the church of Thyatira. So I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. It says, Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Now, have you ever had somebody stare at you in the eyes, and it's like they're staring through your soul? Well, this is kind of what I picture is being depicted here. Nothing is hid from the eyes of Jesus, right? Jesus sees every intent and every motive of our hearts. There's absolutely nothing hidden in our eye or in our life from Jesus. So when I see these flames of fire or eyes of flames of fire, what I picture is Jesus' penetrating gaze in love, but he's still everything's revealed before him. And even though the nominal church, the mainstream church at this time was completely corrupt, but it had such a high profession unto heaven, Jesus could see right through all of that. Jesus could see right through all of that. And the, and the feet are like being uh, fine breasts. That's often used in, in the context of trials because we go through the fiery trials that, that, that polish us and refine us. And of course, the church was, had especially gone through trials during this time period. Jesus says in verse 19, I know thy works in charity and service and faith, and thy patience, and thy works in the last to be more than the first. So as we look at the revelation, or the, sorry, the reformation, we see it, it grow. We see it starts out pretty small. We have, we have um, you know, Wycliffe and uh, the morning star of the reformation growing into a movement that goes through Germany and all throughout Europe. Uh, but it starts off small and gets bigger. Revelation chapter 2, verse 20 says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Now, before I finish reading that, is Revelation chapter 17 the first place where we see the great harlot being talked about in Revelation? Is that the first place? No. And if you're reading along, you'll see that actually God mentions the great harlot right here. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, 
which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed to idols. Now we all know the great harlot is who? The great harlot, Babylon the Great, is the Roman Catholic papacy. It's the Roman Catholic papacy. And no better figure from Old Testament can we use to describe the great harlot than Jezebel, right? Than Jezebel. So here, we're, we're looking at the reign of Jezebel in the church in verse 20. In verse 21, Jesus says, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. How long did God give this church to repent? Well, at least 1,260 years, right? 1,260 years. In that time period, uh, for you students of Bible prophecy, that time period is all throughout Scripture, or at least Revelation and uh, Daniel. But it's the time that God gave and allowed this church to turn. But of course, the Roman papacy does not change, as we know that very well. So here we're talking about the time period of Thyatira, we're talking about the Reformation, and we're talking about the Reformers. And what is it about these Reformers that made them ants, that wanted to leave, that were enabled them to leave that, that circle of death that the Christian church had found themselves on? What is it about these ants that make them different? Now the lesson brings out in Sabbath afternoon, says it brings out that they had purpose, that they had purpose. Now, I like what it talks about here. It talks about a book written by a renowned American psychologist, Philip Cushman, called The Empty Self. And it discusses people who live purposeless lives. Their beliefs are shallow. Little of real significance matters to them, and they have nothing worth dying for. So they have little worth, worth living for. If you haven't found something worth dying for, then you, you are really not living. You're really not living. And purpose is huge. I remember back, uh, for those of you who kind of know at least a little bit about my testimony, <clears throat> I was a mess back uh, before Christ. I was a real big mess. Uh, such a big mess that I dropped out of high school with a GPA of 1.3. That was my GPA back uh, when I dropped out. And I was, I was so wild during that time that I could not even hold a job at McDonald's. Couldn't even hold a job at McDonald's for about a month. I mean, that's, that's, that's how bad I was. But I look back after I gave back or I gave my life to Jesus, who changed everything. I look back and I realize that the one thing that I was searching for the whole time was purpose. I didn't have a purpose. The best purpose I could find was living for myself, living for pleasure. But what you find when you live for pleasure is what? That you actually don't get that much pleasure out of life when you live for pleasure. So. <clears throat> And the thing that God provided for me that especially changed me was purpose. And I've never forgotten that purpose. And it's the one thing, I don't want to say the one thing, but it's a major thing that has carried me through my walk. Even in the hardest times, this purpose has kept me going. So my question of you, has you, have you found the purpose that God has called for you? That's my question for you. Have you found the purpose that God has called for you? Not just collectively, but as an individual. As an individual. And as a Seventh-day Adventist church, what is our purpose? What has God called us to do? What has God called us to do? Now, if you ask some folks in our church, they will say, this is share Christ, which is true. That is true. We are here to share Jesus. Everything revolves around Jesus. The Bible revolves around Jesus. But what makes us different than every other church that, that professes to share Jesus? I mean, that's what the whole evangelical church is profess to do, right? They profess to share Jesus. So what makes us different? Well, I'm going to read one of my favorite passages from the Spirit of Prophecy. It's from Evangelism, page 119. <clears throat> it says this, in a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import. And what is this work? The proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. So what is, a, what is our purpose? What is our purpose 
And it's clear from the Bible, not just spirit of prophecy, from the Bible as well, because Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, that what should happen before the end should come? That this gospel shall be preached into all the world, right? Well, which gospel is Jesus talking about? In Revelation chapter 14, it brings out in clear detail what this gospel is. And here in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, we read that, and I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having what? The everlasting gospel. This is the gospel that we're supposed to be preaching, right? To, to, to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth to every kindred, nation, tongue, and people. Something like that. And it gives us the first, second, and third angel's messages. That is our work. And it's unfortunate, I think, sometimes we as God's people get off course. We start becoming like those ants that go around in circles, the circles of death that we were talking about. And we get off course, and we start concentrating and allowing other things to absorb our attention. Things such as uh, <clears throat> these days, things such as uh, there's a whole bunch of winds of doctrines going around. Uh, feast days, there's the 2520. Uh, uh, Y'all are familiar with that. There's so many things that Satan has started blowing around in our church that really doesn't, it's, it's, it's not what God has called us to do, but yet people find themselves spending so much time and energy trying to, to promulgate these things that God has never told us to do. And I think because we, we forget our purpose, we also allow other, other side um, controversies to come in as well. And one of them that I can think of is women's ordination. Now, I'm not going to say that if you're for women's ordination that you are, you know, you're a heretic or anything like that. But I think because we are not fulfilling our purpose, we allow these things to absorb our attention. And uh, it could be so many things. It could be so many things. So we need to stay on course, or else we're going to find ourselves like those ants going around in circles. And we don't want to do that, do we? So the reformers, they had a purpose. They had a purpose they realized that the Roman Catholic Church was based upon man's tradition, and they had strayed from the Word of God. So their purpose was to call back people to the Word of God. They lifted up God's Word and said, hey, this is the foundation of our faith. This is the foundation of our faith. It's this that's going to carry us through into the, into the glory. <clears throat> it's God's Word alone that's going to give us peace. It's going to give us everything that we've ever wanted. And uh, that was their purpose, to share Christ in that manner. That was their purpose. So now we're going to move to Sunday. You know, I always say it's a good lesson when half your, half your Sabbath school time is taken up on the first, first uh, page there. That's, uh, so, yeah, we're just now making it to Sunday. We're about halfway through. Well, not quite halfway. But anyways, so what is the number one thing that set these reformer ants apart from all the rest of the ants going around in circles. What was the number one thing? His word, His word right? Sola Scriptura. Sola script. That's what they held to. This is the whole hub of the Christian faith. It's the Bible and the Bible alone. If you don't have this as the foundation of what you do, your, Jesus said your foundation is built on what? Sand. It's built on the sand. And it's going to eventually fall. It's just going to, that's just, it's like the laws of physics. What goes up must come down. If what you do is built upon anything else besides the Bible, it's going to come down. That's, it's just, that's what's going to happen. And of course, people don't often like to hear that, but it's the truth. And being, standing on sola scriptura is what enabled Luther to make the declaration to, to the papal powers and overcome them that said, remember when Luther said, here I stand, and I can do no other. And that's what Luther said. So what he was doing was, of course, standing upon the word of God. So if we aren't standing in our life on the word of God, and we have, we have gone off course, what's going to happen is it's, it's not going to pan out too well for us. It's not going to pan out too well for us. <clears throat> I like what it brings out about John Wycliffe here, down at the bottom of Sunday, it talks about John Wycliffe's passion to translate the Bible into English. And what John Wycliffe was, he wanted to enable the, the, the normal person, the non-clergy person, to be able to understand God's word for themselves. And that's, of course, what we should want. Um, 
So what he did was try to, he translated it. But, of course, this was illegal at the time. And he was tried for his faith and condemned as a heretic and sentenced to death. Now, I like what he says at his trial. At his trial, Wycliffe made an earnest appeal. He says, with whom do you think you are contending? With an old man on the brink of the grave? No, with truth. Truth which is stronger than you and will overcome you. That's what Wycliffe said. Oh, that we could be that bold. And I think God, if we stay faithful and we are faced with circumstances like Wycliffe is faced with, which I don't think any of us have really been faced with something like this yet. I don't think any of us have come face to face. I mean, I don't know each of your history, but I could assume maybe that none of us have come to the point where we face somebody, and maybe you have, where they're about to kill you because of your faith in the Bible. But when we get to that point, if we are faithful, I believe God gives us the grace to face persecution when it comes up. That's what he gives to us. So what ways have scriptures com comforted you in times of trial? And we could all probably give some testimonies as to, to instances in our life where we can remember, especially during this time when everything else seemed to be collapsing around us, we were enabled to remain in peace because of our faith in God's word. Our faith in God's word. So God is faithful. Moving on to Monday. So not only are we to stand on God's word, I mean, we could do all the right stuff and, and cling to all the right doctrines, but what good is that if we are not sharing God's word, right? We can be like the Jews of old, where we tried to pride, or we pride ourselves, and we kid ourselves that, hey, we are in God's favor because we got God's word, we're in God's church, and all this good stuff. But if we are not shining lights in this dark world, we are not fulfilling the purpose that God has called us to do, right? We are not fulfilling the purpose that God has called us to do. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to do what? To shine forth his glory in the face of Jesus Christ. So we are not only called to stand, but to shine. Not only called to stand, but to shine. And this is exactly what William Tyndall intended. And Tyndall's greatest desire, I want to read from, from the lesson, was to give England an accurate, readable translation of the Bible, which is awesome. I'm glad that happened. He determined to translate the Bible from the original languages and correct some of the errors in the Bible from the, well, excuse me, in Wycliffe's translation about 100 years, 140 years before. Eventually, Tyndall, too, was arrested and tried. Many of his Bible translations, which were printed in Worms, Germany, were seized and publicly burned. His trial took place in Belgium in AD 1536. He was condemned on the charge of heresy and sentenced to be burned. His executioners strangled him while they tied him to the stake and then burned his body. His dying words were spoken with zeal in a loud voice and were reported as, Lord, this was, this was Tyndall's prayer when he was dying. Open the king of England's eyes. <clears throat> and God miraculously answered, answered Tyndall's prayer because it was right after this in four years that, the four, that four English translations of the Bible were published. Of course, in 1611, we have the King James Version of the Bible, and uh, that was based largely on Tyndall's work. The 54 scholars who produced the work drew heavily from Tyndall's earlier English translation. One estimate suggests that the Old Testament of the 1611 King James Bible is 76% Tyndall's translation, and the New Testament is 83%. So here you have somebody who was a burning light, and his burning desire was to share the Word of God, too. And I'm so grateful for this because now it's a Bible that I can read, that you can read, and we know that as the King James Bible. So I'm very grateful for that. And um, so God has called us to share his word, of course, of course. Moving on to Tuesday, enlightened by his spirit. Who is the ultimate teacher in our lives? Who is the ultimate teacher in our lives? It's Jesus Christ through the person of the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit. So I want to read some Bible verses. Let's go to John chapter 14, verse 26. John chapter 14, verse 26 tells us, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, 
He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whosoever or, or whatsoever I have said unto you. So who's going to bring to remembrance everything that we have heard from Jesus at the right time? The Holy Ghost, right? The Holy Ghost. Now, how can we remember stuff that we've never heard, right? You often, you often hear that, right? How can the Holy Spirit bring back to your remembrance that which is not, or which you haven't put there in the first place, right? So how do we put what Jesus has said to us in our minds in the first place for the Holy Spirit to bring back? It's to read it, right? We need to read it for ourselves. We need to study it. To read it ourselves, and we need to study it. John chapter 16, verse 13, continues this same theme. It says, How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into some truth? All truth, right? He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So really, it's the Holy Spirit that is to be our main teacher. And I kind of get worried. Um, I remember back being in Georgia, if you remember a guy named Creflo Dollar. I don't remember. I don't know if, I don't know if y'all have heard of him, but um, Creflo Dollar was a pretty prominent preacher, at least I don't know where he's at now, at what time, and I don't know how many people I met in Atlanta area that said, Creflo Dollar is my spiritual father. And of course, my mind immediately goes to the scripture where Jesus said, call no man father, but your father which is in heaven. But what I hear from that is that basically they are allowing one preacher man, whoever it might be, to lead them and be their, kind of their their Holy Spirit is kind of what I get from that. Instead of them taking the word for themselves, applying everything that everybody says t according to that word, what they've done is they allow this one person to become their spiritual father, the one to teach them all things and to guide them into all truth. That's kind of what I get from that at least. And we can, if we're not careful, we can do the same thing. We can do the same thing with prominent preachers, even in the Adventist church. We can say, oh, well, what does this person say about this? Does it really matter what so-and-so says about anything? If you are studying your Bible, if you are doing the will of the Lord, what has Jesus promised? He has said, if you do the will of my Father, you shall know the truth. You shall know the truth for yourself. It's the Holy Spirit that teaches us. For it is written, John chapter 6, verse 45, is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God, not of men, of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. So God himself should be our teacher, right? We should not depend. Now, obviously, God gives us teachers. The Bible talks a lot about having preachers, evangelists, Leaders in the church, we're supposed to have all of those to kind of help guide us, but we aren't supposed to be dependent on them. And I get kind of weary when I hear people say to people or to, to pastors or to somebody, you know, I, I, what, what do you say I should do about this? Well, it doesn't really matter what, you know, this person says. No. All that matters is sola scriptura. And, it's, and the more that you know this word... The more that you, you digest this word, the more that you are around this word in the spirit of prophecy, the more that you drink of his testimonies, the easier it is to discriminate between what is right, what is truth, and what's error. Like it, 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 the Bible talks about our senses being, being sharpened and our discernment being sharpened so much that you can just eventually start to hear stuff and know, wait, 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 there's something, there, there's something wrong with that. Let's just hold off here and not just embrace it. And the more that you, you are around Jesus, the more that you know what is not Jesus, if that makes sense. You know, it's, you often hear, in order to know a counterfeit, do you study counterfeits? No, you, you study the genuine article, right? And the more that you become familiar and intimate with the the genuine article, the easier and quicker it is to spot counterfeits. And I think that's what God wants from us. So God wants to be our teacher. He wants to be our individual teacher. Don't rely on humans. I don't care how spiritual they are. I don't care how well they know their Bibles. 
Humans will lead you astray eventually, some way, somehow. I like this exchange between John Knox and, and I think it was, yeah, Mary, Queen of Scots. And Mary said to him, you interpret the scriptures in one manner, and they, talking about the Roman Catholic teachers, interpret in another. Whom shall I believe, and whom shall be judge? And this is what Knox said. He said, you shall believe God. That plainly speaketh in his word, answered the reformer, and farther, excuse me, farther than the word teaches you, you neither shall believe the one nor the other. The word of God is plain in itself, and if there appear any obscurity in one place, the Holy Ghost, which is never contrary to himself, explains the same more clearly in other places, so that there can remain no doubt, but unto such as obstinately excuse me, remain ignorant. So Knox was telling her, look, don't believe me, don't believe them, believe whatever the, the word of the Lord says. And that's pretty, it's pretty simple, right? I mean, it's a pretty simple concept, but why is it so hard for us as Christians to hold fast to that? Why is it so hard for us? If it's in the Bible, keep it. If it's not, throw it out. That was the whole premise of the Reformers. That was the whole premise of the Reformation. If it's in the Bible, in God's word, keep it. If it's not, throw it out. All right, continuing on. Continuing on. Now we're on Wednesday. We are on Wednesday. So the Reformers not only held to sola scriptura, they also held to sola grace. Only grace, only Christ. That's how we are saved, right? What was the, what was the whole, what was the scripture that was kind of like the, 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 what's a good word for it? Uh, the hub of the Reformation. What was the one scripture that Luther, when he was trying to make himself earn some brownie points with God on Pilate's steps, what was the scripture that came and thundered inside his mind that made him scared? He was like, whoa, 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 I'm doing something wrong here, and changed the course of history, basically. What was that one scripture? Yes, yes, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. I want to read from Galatians chapter 311. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. So we are justified through faith, not of works. So I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, For by grace are ye saved through what? Through faith, and that not of yourselves. So basically, it's not what you do that earns this justification, right? It is the gift of God. Verse 9, not of works lest any man should boast. That right there strikes at the very foundation of the Catholic Church or any false religion. Because every false religion, we are told, has what we do at the center of it for our salvation or enlightenment or whatever you want to call it. Man's works is right at the very center, but not with God. There is absolutely nothing that we can do to be justified, right? There's absolutely nothing that earns us justification. I'll continue on. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So we are saved solely by faith, right? Justified by grace. There, there is no calcula or formula that we can follow that will say, God has to look at it and be like, <clears throat> when you reach the, the gates of heaven, get up there and the angel's going to be there and they're going to like, have their checklist out and be like, okay, you went to church on the Sabbath, you ate like such and such, okay, you're good, you're saved. That's not how it's going to work, is it? What's going to work is that you surrendered your life to Jesus. That's how we get grace. You surrendered your life to Jesus. We surrendered our life to Jesus. And of course, you know, there is actually something for us to do because why wouldn't God just save everybody if there was nothing to it? Our job is to realize how broken we are and accept the fact. That's our job. And that's what, that's what Luther and the other reformers realized that the papal powers could not. They saw themselves as God on earth. They saw themselves as the very gates of heaven. 
and they saw themselves as the representatives of Christ. But they were anything but that, right? But Luther and all the reformers understood this principle that, hey, we are sinful. We are broken. We are, we are a mess. We need Jesus. And there is nothing that we can do. There's no amount of penitence. There is no amount of prayers that we can do. There's no amount of Hail Marys, no amount of crawling on our knees, no amount of eating the right foods, no amount of keeping all the right Sabbaths. None of that is going to earn me salvation and peace with God. None of that's going to do that. But what is going to earn me peace with God and salvation is me surrendering my heart, my life to Jesus. That's what they understood. And that's what set them apart from the rest of the ants going around in that big old circle of death that the Christian church was going in at that time. It was these things. So they realized that salvation is freely offered by God. And at that time, that was such a, that was such a revolutionary thought. Hey, there is nothing I can do to earn salvation except give my life to Jesus and surrender and say, hey, Lord, take all of me. This is all I got. That's what they realized. And it, was, it brought such peace to their hearts. And... Um, you know, I often, often think of, you know, people argue a lot about whether the Bible is true and whether Christianity is true or not. And I think, I, I like to think, I've heard, well, I heard it, I can't take it for myself. I, I can't remember exactly who, who said this kind of object lesson. We said grace or the, the, the power of the Bible is kind of like a cord, a power cord. And you look at the power cord on this ground and people argue whether there's power running through it or not. You know, whether it's live wire or whether it's not, there's no power running through it. But when you accept the fact that there is power running through that cord and you put your hands at the end of the cord and that cord shoots you across the room, nothing is ever going to convince you that there is no power running through God's word after that point, is it? And so that's the way the gospel works. And these reformers had felt the power surging through them of the life of Christ. They felt the grace in their life. So my question to you, friend, have you felt that power, that same current running through your life? Have you been thrown across the room to know that there is power in God's word? And no matter what anybody says, I don't care what kind of arguments they come with, whether it's scientific, whether it's uh, spiritualistic, I don't care what it is, there is absolutely nothing that will convince me that this Bible, the word of God, has no power running through it. I know it because I've felt that power in my own life. And that's what the reformers stood upon. They stood upon God's word, God's word alone, and they stood upon the power of God's grace, of what they felt and experienced in their life. That's why the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, how do they overcome Satan? By the blood of the Lamb, through grace, grace alone, by the word of their testimony. So my question to you is, have you had a testimony of being transformed through Christ's grace, through God's word? Do you have your own testimony to make it through? Do you have your own testimony of God's word? Now, I like the question that it asked down at the bottom of Wednesday. It says, if salvation is the work of God in Christ, what role do our good works play in the Christian life? What role do, do, what's the point, if we are saved by grace, through faith, what's the point of even doing good works? What's the whole point? And that's a really good question. That's actually a really good question. Why is it so important for us to do anything if we are just saved by grace? Why do we come to church on Sabbath? Why do we eat right? Why do we dress right? What, whatever checklist type of thing you can find from the Bible, why do we get baptized? What's the whole point if we are saved by grace? And uh, maybe some of you might remember my, my sermon from before, but I go back to it. John chapter 17, verse 17 tells us what? Sanctify them through what? Thy truth. Thy, truth. Thy, word, is truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them through God's word, right? That means we set aside our life. We, we do what God wants us to do through God's word. That's what we do it through, right? But a lot of people miss out on verse 19, and I love verse 19. And it kind of brings out the reason why Jesus obeyed the Father. Why did Jesus sanctify himself? And verse, where did you go? There you are. Verse 19 says this. Jesus says, 
and for their sakes, I sanctify myself. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So why did Jesus do what God wanted him to do? It wasn't just about himself. Everything that he did was for others, right? That's the whole point of us living a life in Christ is not for our own salvation merely, but it's so that we can be better examples and better channels of grace into this world. Think about it. Think about the health message. The whole reason we eat right is not to be saved, right? Because we're saved by grace alone, right? The whole reason that we have a health message is so that way we can win hearts and that way we can, we can have a better and clearer mind to reach people with because if you're not eating right and living right, how good is your mind going to work? It's not going to work too well, is it? So God has given us a health message so that we can live longer, so that we can do more service, right? God has given us a health message so that we can be better lights in this world to reach others. God has given us a health message not to be saved merely so that we can help others live better lives. Jesus said in John 10:10, 10, 10, I have come that they might have what? Life. More life, or life, yes, yes, life, and life, what? More, More abundantly. That's what God wants for each one of us, right? That's why. That's why we do what God wants us to do, not for ourselves, but for others. When we are baptized, we are telling the world that Christ has redeemed me. We are telling the world that God has changed and molded my life in such a way that I am going to give my life now to Jesus. That's what, and so it's a witness. It's a witness to everybody else. So we have only a few moments left with our time. And we are now down to Thursday, which talks about obedience, the fruit of faith. In this world, in our life, there's only two paths for us to follow. There are only two paths. There's only two paths. And Romans brings those two paths out. Well, let's go to Romans chapter 16, verse or sorry, Romans chapter 6, verse 15 through 18, and I am using the hymnal, not the Bible. Don't want to do that. Okay. Romans chapter 6, verse 15 through 18. Let's read that. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, this is from an NIV, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. So there's only two paths, and what are those two paths? Obedience to righteousness, slavery to death through sin. Those are the only two paths. It's the only cho two choices we have. If we are saved, if we are truly saved, God is going to change us. He's going to live within us. And if God is living within us, are we going to live the same lives that we lived before? No. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this walk is a growth. And if plants aren't growing, what are they doing? They're dying, right? So if we are not growing in grace, if we aren't learning and becoming more like Jesus day by day, what are we doing? We're dying. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. Faith shows itself by works. And this is what James talks about in chapter 2. James tells us that even so faith, if it hath not works, is what? Is dead. So if you are not working for the master, if you're not doing good works, doing what God wants us to do, our faith that's going to save us is what? Is dead. It's not there. So does that mean we're going to be saved if our faith is dead? Because we are saved by what? We're saved by faith alone. But... If we have a saving faith, we are going to be connected to the Father, to the vine, through Jesus, and he's going to give us that sap and enable us to live a life in harmony with Jesus. And he's by day by day, moment by moment, hour by hour, we are more and more going to be in his likeness. We are going to be in his likeness. So I want to end. Our time is about up. 
I want to finish with this statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. When powerful foes were uniting to overthrow the Reformed faith, and thousands of sword, swords seemed to about to be unsheathed against it, Luther wrote, Satan is putting forth his fury, and godly pontiffs are conspiring, and we are threatened with war. Exhort the people to contend valiantly before the throne of the Lord by faith and prayer, so that our enemies, vanquished by the Spirit of God, may be constrained to peace. Our chief want, our chief labor, is prayer. Let the people know that they are not exposed to the edge of the sword and to the rage of Satan, and let them pray. So, the Reformation. God called some ants out of that circle of death to call other ants out of that circle of death that the church was owned to. And has the Reformation stopped? Have we reached the end of the Reformation yet? No, the Reformation is still going on. And uh, it's up to us to carry on that torch that the Reformation gave us and uh, to live the lives that Jesus connected through faith, that Jesus wants us to live, to be as lights in this world and to stand upon solely God's word. That is what God has called you to do. And so with that, I hope you are blessed. And again, if you want a copy of the CD or DVD of this lesson, uh, just call 916-457-6511. Again, that's 916-457-6511. And the email is csh at sacscentral.org. Make sure to tell them which lesson it is, and make sure to give them your address, too, if you email them. And the offer is C202418. Again, that offer is C202418. So with that, hope you have a blessed Sabbath, and um, may God be with you.